Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe. Those willing, if you will, to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, my partner Ravinder is here in the studio with me, and I believe she's ready to be uncertain for an hour. Is that true or false? Oh, you know what? I think I'm always uncertain about everything. I think that's actually part of the wisdom of growing older. You just become more and more uncertain. I don't know anything anymore, but I am open to learning more stuff. That is for sure. There's, There's an old saying, the more I know, the less I... You know, the less I know, the more I know, the more I realize, the less I know. Something like that anyway. Absolutely. You have some wisdom words for the day. What are they? My wisdom words for today. I actually have three. First of all, stay warm. It is frigidly cold here. So, yes, definitely do what you can to stay warm. Secondly, pay attention to today's radio show. Uh, The interview today is about finding peace in a frantic world, and I think... We could all do with some of that. And thirdly, I want to let everybody know another way that you can learn more about the wisdom of Eldon Taylor, because he is on Midnight in the Desert Radio tomorrow night from 9 to 11 o'clock Pacific time. If you search your own radio schedules, you can see, you know, which network it's airing on. But yes, Eldon will be on Midnight in the Desert, which was originally started by Art Bell, for those of you who are familiar with that. It's been taken over by David Schrader, but he'll be interviewing Eldon, so you will get to learn, you know, more about Elton's philosophy. So do try and tune in. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to the show. And, and I, you know, that's a nice plug. But um, all right, let's get on with today's show. All right. Well, it, if I can't plug my husband, who can? <laughs> it's about time your, vo- ro- your radio voice arrived. That's the first time you've spoken with any volume today. Sorry. All right. In today's spotlight, I would like to discuss the relationship between perception and the stressors in our lives. Whenever I ask someone about the stressors in their life, there are certain answers that are common to almost everyone. That is, their job, money, the children, finances, misunderstandings, and once again, money. Now... There are also those habits we want to break, the weight we want to lose, issues around health and wellness, and so forth. But it seems for most people, the daily stressors are all wrapped up in the job, family, and money. Think about that for a moment. Why should these be stressors? Why should I worry about money, employment, and our family? Well, the answer seems obvious. Because aside from health, which we tend to take for granted until it's lost, these three areas concern us most because they are worrisome. Okay, we now have a definition that goes like this. I worry about family, money, and job because they are worrisome and therefore worthy of worry. (laughs) Wow. By definition, I have just created a new tautology a self-defining statement or term, like a bachelor is an unmarried man. And in that circularity, many of us operate our lives. What if I redefine my worries? I mean, why can't I? Moreover, why shouldn't I? Changing our perception is an effective way to redefine almost anything. So how do I go about altering my perception? One of the great advantages to mindfulness is that it insists on being present in the moment. Think about in the moment. In the moment, I have a job and I can choose to be grateful for that. Not everyone has an income. In the moment, most of us have the money we need for right now. 
We have a roof over our heads and food in the cupboard. In the moment, we have families to love and appreciate. In the moment, if I choose to be grateful for everything in my life, that one switch in my perception changes everything. Voila, stress is gone. That gratitude attitude is just magic. Reframing our perception is one of the healthiest things we can do when it comes to improving the quality of our lives. Simply thinking of the person who cuts you off in traffic as needing to rush to the hospital because they have a bleeding child in the back seat neutralizes all anger and aggression. My suggestion? Think of the stressors in your life and make a conscious decision to reframe them redefine them and thus alter your perception change your perception and you'll change your expectation and this will indeed change your life my thoughts anyway what are yours Ravinder? you know i'm a strong believer in that i'm always trying to find something positive or a different way to look at certain issues so yeah i recommend that highly um that just makes life easier. I must admit, when I first read the article that you were just reading, um, when, when you start at the beginning and you say, I worry about my family because I worry about my family, <laughs> that circularity. And at first I thought, huh, that does it, you know, okay. But then the more I thought about it, that's exactly it. I still get really concerned about our boys, you know. Our oldest is now tw- 25 and doing really well but he'll always be my boy and I'll always worry about him so it's always worrisome and I have the same for all the members of my family so it really does make sense it's just interesting you know when we have the worry about worry kind of rheostat it it, we, we don't we never move from whatever those settings are uh, if I tell the rheostat in my home to maintain the temperature at 70, it's going to be plus or minus a couple degrees of 70, okay? Now, <clears throat> the minute I tell myself that this is wor- worthy of worry, it's like that rheostat. I'm never away from the worry, plus or minus just a couple of degrees. It's a matter of where my mind is at the moment, uh, but the worry is still there in the background. It's latent, and because it's latent, it still applies pressure. And that pressure we can see in our blood pressure, we can see in, you know, <clears throat> the amount of tension or stress that we might otherwise experience in our lives. So it only makes sense to redefine it. I mean, there's some things in your control and some things that aren't. So those things that aren't are not things that we should be investing any any kind of worry about. And those that are, we do our very best in a positive way with a gratitude attitude. And I think our world is a better place for it. But today's guest is going to give us some real insight. Um, And he has a marvelous book out there. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last live show featured Chief Norm Stamber, uh, Chief Stamper, if you didn't uh, weren't present for the show, is the former chief of police in uh, uh, of Seattle. Uh, he's also a professor and, and um, works with uh, several different universities. We discussed his book, and it's a great read. And I suggest to all of you, you get and read this book, "To Protect and Serve: How to Fix American Police." Rodney wrote. What a great show, and what a terrific public service your show is. Thanks for the wonderful programming. Brian wrote, good stuff. It would be great to see a mid-sized city's police force take the kind of systemic steps the chief suggests as a case study. I totally agree, Brian. Cynthia wrote, hello, Ravinder and Eldon. I just wanted to thank you both for your free forgiveness and letting go program. I listen to it most mornings, and if I'm not listening to it, I'm listening to one of the tracks from Eldon's and Self-Sabotage Collection. I really enjoy the emails and have recently subscribed to Eldon's blog. I appreciate what you do. Thank you again. Now, if you're listening to the, this show and you are not receiving our free e-newsletter or my weekly blog, 
You can begin to get either or both today, and they cost nothing. Simply go to eldentaylor.com and subscribe to our free publication. Further, for a very long time, I have been convinced that the path to self-empowerment begins with forgiveness. I said this way back in the early 80s, and that was long before we had all the research that we have today. Uh, But indeed, uh, I could say there's robust data out there that supports the value of forgiveness. Forgive yourself, forgive all others, accept forgiveness in your life, and your life will change. You will not be that victim. You will not be blaming. You will not be holding the animus and anger that you might be otherwise holding and you will not feel like you are a victim that's the first step and to that end we have a program that you can download absolutely free on my website eldentaylor.com called forgiving and letting go and i believe again if there is any place for you to start that has to be the place your thoughts on that ref Oh, absolutely, yeah, and uh, it is easy to access. Just go to com, click on the button that says Forgiving, and you can uh, access it right there. It, you know, this is a program used to be our bestseller, and then one day it dawned on me if I feel so, so deeply that that's where we begin, we should make it available as a public service. It should be free. So do go get your copy. It isn't going to bite you. It isn't going to hurt you, I promise. Terry wrote, I purchased your motivated power set three weeks ago. I have started reaping the fantastic results. I feel more motivated and energetic than ever before. Leora wrote, thank you for your amazing Intertalk programs. They have been integral in helping me and changing my life for many years. Ephraim Road, hi, Dr. Eldon Taylor. You changed my life for the better. Thank you. And High Vibe Karma wrote, I just started reading your book about the power of your mind, and let me tell you, your every page has one piece of information unlike other books. So thank you very much. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but we do love your feedback, so please keep it coming. You can opine by sending me an email at eldontaylor.com, that's E-L-D-O-N at eldontaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. We do sincerely appreciate your comments and suggestions, so please do keep them coming. Now to today's show, mindfulness, finding peace in a frantic world, with our special guest, author, Professor Mark Williams. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Mark Williams is Emeritus Professor of Clinical Psychology and Honorary Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Psychiatry, University of Oxford. The main focus of his research and clinical work has been to understand how best to prevent serious clinical depression and suicide. With colleagues John Teasdale of Cambridge and Zindel Siegel of Toronto, he developed Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, MBCT for short, for prevention of relapse and reoccurrence in depression, and research has now found that MBCT markedly reduces the rate of future depression in those who have suffered the most serious and persistent forms of major depression. Professor Williams is a fellow of the British Academy and the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. He is also the author of The Mindful Way Through Depression, Freeing Yourself from Chronic Unhappiness, and Mindfulness, A Practical Guide to Finding Peace in a Frantic World, the subject of today's show. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Mark Williams. Thank you very much, Eldon. It's, it's very nice to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. I love your book. It's, it, it's very well, I think, very well written, and it, and it just steps anybody right down a path as to how they can take this material incorporated in their life and change their life for the better right from the get-go right from day one even though there are eight steps right from day one i believe that this this adds elements that can empower an individual so i want to compliment you on the book and i want to suggest to all of our readers they get out there and they get it mindfulness an eight-week plan for finding peace in a frantic world now professor we like to know three things on this show Who is the messenger? What is the message? And, of course, how do we use it? So to that end, 
What are you passionate about, sir? And when and why did you begin to practice mindfulness? I came to mindfulness um, in the early 90s, I think it was, when my colleagues and I were trying to solve a problem. And the problem was that uh, depression, which by then had quite a few treatments that worked quite well, antidepressants and cognitive therapy and other therapies as well, but we also knew that one of the major problems about depression is it keeps coming back, especially, you know, if you stop, say, taking the pills, as many people do when they feel better. And when you do that, um, depression tends to come back with about the same frequency as we've had it in the past. And we turned to mindfulness because we wanted, instead of producing a treatment for depression, to see if we could actually do something which would be would be prevent future depressions. So we wanted to have people who, who weren't depressed at the moment, but knew or feared that they were vulnerable and offer them something that would help them. And that's where, why we turned to mindfulness. You, you know, I, 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 I want to get into your book in great detail today, but one of the things that um, my own experience and that of some of my colleagues would uh, agree upon is that the, there are a number of people who experience depression, not chronic depression, mind you, but they experience mm. depression. Um, mood states, if you will, but it's generally beyond a mood state. It lasts longer that go unreported. The, the data, the statistics about the number of people who experience uh, depression is is um, kind of scary. If you look at the data, 16.2 million adults in the United States, uh, which is, what, 6.7% of American adults that reportedly have had at least one major depressive episode. But I think that's an understatement. I think... There is um, there's a lot of depression that goes unreported, unrecognized even as depression. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's true or not based on your research, Professor? I think it is true. And uh, it's a bit like an iceberg. You can only see the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot of the berg under the water. And depression is a spectrum. So you get a clinical diagnosis if you've got low mood and lack of interest in things you used to enjoy, you know, a sense of worthlessness, eating and sleeping problems, lack of energy, can't concentrate, suicidal feelings. But many people have some of those much of the time and have a sort of a low level sadness or feeling unfulfilled or discontented. And um, uh, and then they don't come for help because they don't think it's serious enough. But also some people with serious depression don't go for help because they feel ashamed about it in a way that they wouldn't feel ashamed if they'd broken a leg or if they had flu. Um, but somehow um, they feel ashamed about it. And that's partly because depression has the seeds of its own sense of shame. So one of the symptoms of depression is to feel worthless. And that worthlessness, I think, can feed the idea that, well, I'm not worth it. I'm not even worth treating. Nobody will take me seriously. Um, uh, it's just no good anymore, and so on and so forth. And and I think that means that people don't don't come forward for help. And then other people say, well, can't you just pull yourself together? Go out and enjoy yourself. And somehow, <laughs> as if they hadn't thought of that, um, it, that doesn't work. They need then, I think, some, uh, some standing back and seeing what help can I get? Um, can I read a book? Can I go to a therapist? Can I speak to a friend? And at last tell somebody, you know what, I'm not feeling as good as I really think I can be. You, you, and I, I wanted to get that kind of set up before we get into your show, because I think there are a lot of people who may look at uh, the nature of your work and say, well, I'm not depressed, so there's no real value to that. But when you, when you describe it, when you flush it out uh, through its symptomology, um, there's a vast number of people that uh, I am convinced that would benefit from this book, um, either directly or to, to their loved ones and, and whatnot around them, uh, because there is a great deal more depression than there is reported. Professor, you, you heard today's spotlight. What are your thoughts on the idea of reframing our perception of the so-called stressors in our life? 
I think it's a really good idea. Reframing is a is a nice, gentle word to use. That's why I think it's so appealing that very often there are many, many more perspectives on any one thing than we ever think possible. And uh, and and I think what the usefulness of even knowing that is that you can begin to see the thoughts that come and those worries that come and treat them a little more kindly. Um, you can see your thoughts as mental events that come and go like clouds in the sky and watch them come and go, realizing that the mind is doing the best it can. Um, the mind is trying to, you know, stir you into action about something, but it doesn't mean that it's telling you the truth. And uh, our imagination can sometimes be stronger than reality. And uh, and that's because we're, our minds are so clever. Um, for example, if you've had a small accident in your car, you might not very much worry about the car if everybody was safe and nobody was hurt. But if you start beginning to say to yourself, oh, my gosh, what if I had been hurt? What if I'd been killed? What would have happened to my family? Then that what if can be a more powerfully disturbing thing than the thing that actually happened. And uh, so it shows the power of imagination to bring us things to to allow us to imagine things that are even worse than the reality itself and i think that goes for a number of different things and reframing in the way you described i think is a really helpful way to way to go all right let's let's get some definitions out of the way if we can professor it seems to me that there are a lot of people out there that confuse mindfulness with exotic practices found in eastern religions um, they tend to think of mindfulness only in a sense of meditation, like, you know, I'm going to close my eyes, I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on breathing or something. But mindfulness, is it, where it can include that, is also a lot more than that. So, Professor, flesh out for us, if you will, a full definition of mindfulness, particularly in, in light of how you see it and use it. Yeah, well, mindfulness is really, it simply means awareness, a clear-sighted awareness, you might say lucid awareness. And uh, it really means bringing attention moment by moment to what goes through your mind and what goes through your life, in a sense, and doing that, paying attention in a kindly way, in a way that sort of sees what it sees with some gentleness and compassion and open-heartedness. And it's actually quite difficult to do. I mean, most of us know mindlessness, mindlessness, more than we know mindfulness. You know, we know we rush about or we don't taste our food or we we listen with only one ear to a conversation because there's something else going on in our heads. And that sense of rushing all the time um, means that we're often not aware of what's going on in our life from time to time. Whereas mindfulness uh, sort of wakes us up and reminds us to pause, to take stock, to notice what's happening and to see clearly what's going on in your world. Okay, let me see if we can unpack that just a little more. I've heard it argued that mindfulness is the path to change, to rewire, to retrain the brain uh, uh, or the mind. And, 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 and there is evidence that you know meditation does indeed alter the physiological nature of our brain. But others yeah. argue... You don't need to change, for mindfulness recognizes and cultivates the best of who we are, of human beings. Now, it seems to me that both of these could be true. They're, they don't have to be opposites. I mean, what are your thoughts on these two ideas, Professor, and why? I think it's exactly right that they don't have to be opposites. In other words, it is a mind training. You're training your attention. Um, you're training all sorts of things. and We know that it changes the brain. Uh, but it's also a training in accepting things for how they are, as you were saying earlier in your reframing piece. Um, and actually, because we don't normally um, see things exactly how they are, moment by moment, um, we are coming in contact through mindfulness with reality and seeing the best of things. So in other words, we need to train ourselves to step outside some of the the sort of the trivial concerns that so bother us and distract us. But that takes some work, it takes some effort. And that's why, you know, people generally go on a program or read a book or spend about eight weeks just spending a little time each day training the mind in this way. 
it surprises me sometimes that, you know, how willing we are to take on all sorts of exercise programs uh, to shape our bodies and diets and th- and and how little time we we seem to be willing to spend on true introspection meditation mindfulness and and unfortunately i we don't teach it in the schools and i think we should but we'll we'll take all of that up when we get back we have a break coming up so For all of you out there, we are speaking with Professor Mark Williams about his wonderful book, Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. You know, I used to interview lots of people, and very often I would find antagonistic, um, I'd find myself antagonistic, if you will, with some of the guests, because I just didn't agree with what they were saying. I stopped that. I stopped it about 18 months ago. If I bring a guest to this show, I've looked at this guest, who the guest is, what his material is, and I so totally endorse it that that's the reason they're here. Get the book, Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at, get ready for this, mark.williams, ampersand, psych, dot, ox.ac.uk or listen just go to oxford mindfulness one word dot org okay do please stay tuned we'll be right back you're listening to provocative enlightenment with elton taylor change has never been easier whether you wish to lose weight stop smoking build better relationships become creative enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Mark Williams about his work and book, Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. You can learn more about our big guest by visiting his website at Oxford Mindfulness, one word, OxfordMindfulness.org. I'll let that other site go, but it's posted in our chat room if you're interested in going there. All right, every week we ask a guest for their favorite music. Music that has some real meaning to them. Ravinder, don't do that. You have me responding to you and the the audience out there doesn't know what i'm laughing at suddenly all right so are you through i'm through i didn't know where you got that website from either all right never mind <laughs> all right all right as you know by now music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas including intelligence creativity personality and social behavior it's also something I'm writing a book on. I've done a great deal of research. And um, we have collected now over the past couple of years the favorite music of some of the brightest people on the planet and their reasoning behind it. So, Professor, yours may well be in that book. You chose Sarah McLaughlin singing Answer from her album Afterglow. Tell us why. Why is it important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, how it exactly informs you about who I am, I'm not quite sure, but I think it's a great tune. That's the first thing. 
it's beautifully sung and I, I just love great tunes. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that it speaks about relationships. It's somebody who's offering to be there for somebody. And I think that's just a wonderful um, sentiment. It's a sort of, it's, it's, it talks about solid ground. I will be your solid ground. And I think that that is so understated, but so necessary that we should be solid ground for each other. Um, there's all sorts of things we promise and all sorts of things and all sorts of ways in which we break our promises to each other. But I think when it comes down to it, if we can be solid ground for each other, it's an amazing thing we've done. You know, I really want to take that up before we finish the show. But before we get to that, let me ask you this. I interviewed Congressman Tim Ryan about his book on mindfulness. And he pretty well stated that mindfulness has the potential to become a transformative social phenomenon. When you talk about, you know, being grounded for one another, Mm. I think about, you know, naturally Tim Ryan's comments on this, trying to get all of Congress to meditate. They're far, far cry from doing that right now. There's no, there's very little mindfulness in Washington, D.C. to this day. But what are your thoughts, Professor? Does it have a transformative social potential? Well, I think it does in various ways. Um, One of the things we're finding in Britain, there's a lot of work in mindfulness now in the police force, in uh, in prisons. Uh, There's mindfulness in our own parliament, though, you know, we have our problems here, as you do there, about the arguments going on in parliament. But um, there are many parliamentarians now in both houses that have uh, learned mindfulness and they have persuaded the civil service who, uh, who who run various government organizations to to practice mindfulness as well. And I think what they're reporting to us is it helps them keep steady, keep grounded in the midst of all the chaos of their lives and also to pay attention, to take time to pay attention to what really matters. I mean, we like you have uh, a problem of a sort of inequality within the country. The country is very rich in many ways, but there are many, many people that don't see those riches. And uh, learning to really pay attention to what's going on, I think, is very important. Um, We have, for example, a minimum wage here, but recent research has found that what happens is the minimum wage is a bit sticky. So people get appointed on a minimum wage, but they don't rise necessarily from it. They sit on the bottom of the minimum wage. It gives uh, a sort of sense of excuse to employ people on the minimum wage. So something that sounds good actually turns out not to have the effects that it was intended to do. And we need to pay attention to the actuality of what's going on rather than the rhetoric. All right. To that end, let me ask you this. I mean, it's it's often very helpful to, you know, look at causal connections, not that uh, the connections are necessarily causal, but it. Mm. W- we've already talked that, you know, there's there's a lot of depression that goes unnoticed and um, and, and 16.2 million Americans alone report uh, or have been treated for a depressive episode. So what do you think is, is why is it so prevalent in our societies? Well, one of the things that um, I mean, the prevalence rates have been quite steady, but the reason why it seems more prevalent is because the age at which you first become depressed has lowered over the last few decades. And it's not clear why that's happened. Uh, But about 50, 60 years ago, people seemed to get depressed for the first time in middle age or late middle age. So it wasn't very common for people to get depressed young. But decade by decade, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, epidemiologists and clinicians started to see more people coming to them at a younger age. And now it's pretty clear that the first age of onset of depression is between 13 and 15 years of age. Both American data and British data and data from all over the world suggest that that's the age of the first episode. And that means that uh, depression, when it happens later on in life, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, 
is a reactivation of an old pattern of thinking and feeling and so on that often started very young in life. And that, I think, gives us now the sense that although maybe, you know, 20 percent of people will be depressed throughout their life, that may have always been true. But if those people who get depressed start at this young age, tragically young in a sense, then uh, those people are experiencing more repeated episodes because they've got a whole life ahead of them where depression could blight it, which wasn't always true in history as far as we can see. Do you, I mean, we don't know. I, I, I'll accept that as just a, a scientific statement, but now I'm going to ask you as a person uh, who's, ex, you know, worked in this area, do you have some, any theories about why that might be the case? Well, it started, this trend started before the major things that we now blame, like, um, you know, screens, devices, um uh, mobile phones and uh, smartphones and so on. Um, this this trend started before that, but other things have happened that may be involved. There has been a, a welcome liberalisation of work patterns, which means that uh, uh, those who are in work often it's both parents who are working, and that that has led to a change in family structure, which may be producing some. Um, uh, difficulties that it's going to take time to adjust to. Um, another thing that's happened is that as countries over the 20th century became generally more wealthy, what happened is that they're often, except in times of real hardship like wartime, um, there came a, 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 an emerging gap between the richest and the poorest in countries. And we know that where that occurs, the rates of uh, hopelessness go up, the rates of trust in other people go down. And uh, you don't need a very big change when it's a societal shift in, in everybody to get some quite profound changes in, in, in people's sense of uh, a lowering of people's well-being and an increase in people's sense of exhaustion and hopelessness. Let me ask you this. I've, I've heard it suggested that there is a correlation where our younger generation is concerned, particularly uh, between depression and, and, for that matter, suicide, tied up with uh, social media, use of electronic devices, uh, you know, texting on our phones and, and, and the anonymity that uh, some of us uh, take advantage of in inappropriate ways and, and so forth. Do you think there is anything to that idea? Well, yes, that you're right that there have been found associations between that. So several recent studies find that association. It's more difficult to know. That's the association you pointed to between the, uh, the more frequent use of devices and depression and lowered well-being. Um, what's not quite clear at the moment is which way round the causal arrow goes. Um, is it that people who are slightly more depressed and anxious spend more time on their devices? Um, whereas those who have a, a, a greater sense of balance and well-being actually can let go of their devices more easily? Or is it that for any two people, if one uses a device and the other one doesn't, then it will send the person who uses it into a, a reduced flourishing, reduced well-being? We don't know, but... The bet that you can you can say is it's probably always round when you can't tell quite what the causal link is. It would be surprising if people who were more depressed, young people more depressed using the mobile phones, if, if it didn't have an effect on their communication, uh, on their ability to uh, to chat to those who need their chat to face to face. So um, I think it's wise to be very cautious in in thinking that there's no harm at all. I think it's wise to think, OK, uh, let's train our young people to use them when they're appropriate and to let go of them, to know where the off switch is and then to come back. It's a sort of it's giving more respect to a device to know how to switch it off, to come back to it when you need to, to switch it off when you don't. All right. We've kind of fleshed out, I think, what the problem is now. So let's dive directly into your book and 
and and the approach that you have, an eight-week plan, the subtitle, for finding peace in a frantic world. Why eight weeks, sir? I mean, are you conforming to some brief therapy, some cognitive format there? or Why did you decide on eight weeks and flesh out for us exactly what cognitive therapy in a mindfully based way is, please? Okay, so in fact, there were two uh, people that influenced us. One actually is from Seattle, which is uh, Professor Marsha Linehan of the University of Washington, who'd done some powerful work uh, with people who are very have strong emotional feelings and impulses that they found were creating havoc in their lives. Um, they sometimes get a diagnosis called borderline personality disorder, but that diagnosis really describes a very chaotic um, and difficult lifestyle with very strong emotions. And Marsha Linehan had done, developed a, an ingenious uh, a treatment called dialectical behavior therapy. And mindfulness was part of the skills training that went alongside her um, individual psychotherapy. And that those were eight-week modules. She would teach a module of mindfulness, and then they would move on to a module on interpersonal effectiveness and so on. And she put us in touch with John Kabat-Zinn's work, John Kabat-Zinn at uh, UMass Medical Center in Worcester in Massachusetts had himself developed a program. And that, funnily enough, was also eight weeks. He called it mindfulness-based stress reduction. And he developed it for people in the general hospital whose doctors um, found they couldn't do very much more for people in chronic pain, for example, or all sorts of, of chronic physical conditions. And he'd done research to find um, as Marsha Linnan had found with her emotional problems um, that she was treating, that John's patients also responded really well to eight weeks of mindfulness. And so when we went to John and said, we're looking for a way to try to prevent depression coming back, uh, to try to deal with people's sense of worthlessness and exhaustion, uh, do you think that your approach, the mindfulness approach, would be useful? And uh, he said he thought it would be. And then we developed, because we were cognitive therapists, uh, both clinicians and researchers, we integrated some of that therapy, as you pointed out, into the mindfulness-based stress reduction program to make an eight-week program, two hours a week. People come to class and then they practice at home like they do in the other, in the other approaches as well. Very interesting. Let me ask you this, because I'm asked it often, and I basically tell people you don't live in a vacuum, so there's no such thing as a permanent fix. But if someone were to use your eight-week program, could they then just say, okay, I'm permanently free of depression, I don't have to do this anymore, or please expand? Well, well okay, so we found in our research that it reduces the risk Um in people with the most serious uh, uh, depressions lasting the longest, perhaps they had trauma in childhood and adolescence, and that spin them out of control, uh, spun them out of control, that, that it, it reduces the future depression by about 50%, down from about 65 uh, to the low 30%. But there are still some people who will get depressed in, in the future. And uh, our follow-up period tend to be that critical 12 or 24 months after They've had the eight-week program, and that's where we see the biggest benefit. Um, but we know from other research when cognitive therapy has that effect in reducing relapse, the lower relapse rate goes for quite a few years after that. Um, so I think that people, I mean, there's no such thing as a sort of a, a magical cure or a, um, uh, a cure forever, but many people who've been through the program say that it's been very transformative and have reset their parameters. Um, it's reset their relationships. It's reset their the pattern of their day. And they've got somewhere they can turn to if they notice the warning signs of another episode. Because we, we actually teach people, it's a, use, one of the use of cognitive therapy is to teach people about the warning signs. What is their individual signature of relapse? How will they know their particular way that things are going wrong in their lives again so they can get back to using some of the meditations or some of the other di strategies they've got earlier than they would normally you know i in reading your book i thought wouldn't it be wonderful if people just established a habit uh the habit as a result of this training that they incorporated this thinking in the way of their life 
Um, and and as I you know as I looked at that, I truly believe that if the you know neurons that fire together wire together and all that sort of thing, that habits are very uh, very difficult to break. And if we were to build that habit, I truly believe we would we would be able to escape uh, a lot of the what should I say mood states, depression, uh, those those uh, feelings where we just don't seem to be able to find happiness and joy. G- agree or disagree, Professor? Yes, indeed. I mean, it's about building different sorts of habits. Um, because actually, the world is always teaching us something. And mostly, the world is teaching us how to be frantic and rushed. So it's not as if the world is neutral. And by taking a little time each day, the discovery is for many people that they can learn to strengthen their sustain and sustain at their attention, which dissolves the power of distractibility. And that itself is a major benefit. Okay. <clears throat> You set out seven characteristics of doing and being, modes of the minds in your book. I I found that very interesting. Uh, Can you unpack those for us and and inform us as to why it's important that we be aware of them, Professor? Well, the doing mode of mind is is the mind that actually solves problems. And it's very good and very helpful to us. But often it's taken over by a sort of driven doing. That is where we feel we must get something done. Um, and that's often not as true as our mind tells that it is. It is. Um, so the doing mind then goes into overdrive and just focuses on that one task, in a sense, to the exclusion of all other. You know, you stay awake late as if this was the most important thing. You don't eat, perhaps you ignore somebody calling you for a meal and you, 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 you don't listen to your children and, you know, you don't really pay attention to anything else. But interestingly, when you stop that, you then are very distracted and all over the place and can't concentrate. So um, what we suggest is that the, we learn various ways of noticing that mind state see when it's useful to you, because sometimes it might well be. So we're not saying it's make an enemy, but come to a state of being in which you see clearly these goals and these tent distractions, but you see them more like clouds in the sky that you can see um, come and go, sometimes very black clouds, sometimes white and fluffy, but they're just um, mental events that come into our minds and leave again. And with treating them with kindness and treating our mind with respect because the mind is, as I say, trying to do the best it can in bringing you these things to solve. But sometimes it's possible just to take a pause and say, no, I don't have to do this now. And that's really the characteristic of the being mode where you take things much more moment by moment and uh, much more tenderly and less harshly. Uh, You know, I've got so many more questions and we've got about two minutes. So I'm going to ask you two of them. Uh, real quick, like if we can get those in, tell us what a habit releaser is and how and why we should use it and how important is empathy? I think a habit, a habit release is easy to describe. It's things that we don't even know we're doing. So a habit releaser would be things like sitting in a different chair at the meal table or in the office, if you can, or at a meeting. So you see a different perspective or it might be going to the movie theater and watching a film, just turning up and watching what's there rather than planning it all beforehand. You know, like you did when you were a when you're a kid, you probably just went with friends and you didn't care what you watched. And there's a sense of just shaking things up a bit in a very gentle way. That's the habit releaser. Good. And empathy, sir, how important is it? It's really important. And interestingly, the sense of empathy of feeling with is a critical aspect of um, what you might lead to then, which is compassion. So empathy is feeling with compassion is acting towards um, and very different from pity. Pity is is often um, quite exhausting. But empathy is the first part of what we then what then unfolds into compassion, taking action uh, in response to somebody else's suffering. And that somebody else might be a member of the family. Sometimes it's ourselves. And it may uh, may surprise a lot of folks out there, but empathy is as beneficial for you yourself personally 
as it may be in your interactions with someone else. Absolutely. All right. Professor, I want to thank you for your work and your wonderful book. I uh, appreciate your willingness to come to the show and share everything with us. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to encourage all of you out there to get mindfulness, an eight-week plan for finding peace in a frantic world by Dr. M- Professor Mark Williams and Danny Penman. Be sure to get the book. Until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.